<clears throat> All right, so last time we had sort of an introductory lesson of fracture mechanics, and we talked about stress intensity factors, and at the end we talked about something called the fracture toughness. So, right, so that's, the, that's a measure of a material's resistance for a crack to propagate. Right? It's a material property. And right at the end, as a, an application to hydraulic fracturing, we I wrote the equation down that P net, so P net, remember, is the difference in the pressure in the fracture minus the minimum principal stress trying to close the fracture. Uh, that's equal to at you know, during propagation, that's equal to K1C over pi L, where L is the fracture length, fracture half length. Okay. So I wrote that down at the end of class. But this is really derived for a center cracked infinite plate. So it would something like we were talking about in class last time. So sort of an, an infinite plate that has a small center crack of length 2A, or I guess in this case 2L. Okay. That's not really that applicable to hydraulic fractures. So what, you know, in, in a real hydraulic fracture in, in situ, so what, what is possibly a step closer in, uh, to re realistic. Now remember, w what we're doing here is we're trying to, we're looking at analytic models, models that are tractable on a sheet of paper, right? Um, you know, modern day fracture designs are all done with computer codes. But we're trying to gain some insight into the important parameters, so we're going to look at simple models, and so we do a lot of idealizations, okay? And so one idealization that we might think of is that a hydraulic fracture could be, say, a radial, a radially symmetric fracture, so it grows in a radially symmetric way away from a wellbore in, a symphony, in, a, in an infinite body. Right? So it's in, infinite in all directions, and there's a radial crack in the center of it, and th as the crack extends, it's going to extend equally in a radial direction. And so we're not going to derive it, but there was a guy, Sack, in 1946, who derived an expression for a radial symmetric crack subject to an internal pressure. What the p net would be at propagation, and the expression he derived is this. And so that's in terms of G, right, your straight energy release rate, or at, at propagation, we might say that's G1C, at propagation, okay? And remember, G is related, G1C is related uh, to K1C by this relationship. So if you plug that back in, just in case you wanted to write it in terms of fracture toughness, you'd get this expression here. And so you can see that this, for a radius symmetric crack, and the one for a center crack plate, is not that different. Right? They're not that different. They're just different by the coefficient up, up front. And this, you know, is a radially growing crack, and that's just a crack that's extending on the tips. Right? So a little bit different, but very similar in form. <coughs> so this doesn't take into account <coughs> 
in any way the volume of the crack. Right? So this is as if the crack were infinitely thin and just expanding at the tips. Right? And not, you know, as if the, the, the crack didn't have any opening due to the mechanics. Okay? And so if you include the volume, or to include the volume, we look at, there's a famous series of papers by a guy named Snedden, also in 1946, who basically, from a mechanics perspective, derived what the volume of a circular crack would be subject to a pressure. Now, in this case, the crack's not extending. This is just a stationary crack. So a stationary crack subject to an internal pressure, what would the volume be? The internal pr pressure being P net. Okay. And so if we combine these two, and eliminate R, so in other words, solve one of them for R and plug it into the other. Then, then we have the final expression, P net is equal to pi cubed g cubed e squared all over 12 1 minus e squared. So this is the net pressure at which a fracture will propagate at propagation where the crack has some non, you know, it's not infinitely thin. It has some volume, right, with these material properties. So this is from a fracture mechanics perspective, right? So this includes the energetics associated with propagating the crack. Okay. But it doesn't include any fluid mechanics. Right? So here we're just saying P net, but we're not talking about where, how P net, where it comes from. And, right? So we're going to hold on to this expression, and we'll come back to it. So in 1961, there were two guys, Perkins and Kern, and these are kind of the first analytic models at doing, with, you know, trying to arrive at something useful to predict hydraulic fracturing, okay, and that include the effects of both the fluid mechanics and the solid mechanics, right? So conservation of mass in the crack and the deformation of the solid material. And so what they started with was some earlier work of Lamb in 1932 who derived the equation or came up with the equation for the pressure drop along an elliptical cross section with a fixed height HF and a width W. So <coughs> so this is for an elliptical cross section 
with fixed height HF that extends in the X direction with fixed height. and has a width, w, that's a function of x and t. So then using another solution of Snedden, so obviously this, the, the, the equation of lamb is for a fluid, right? So I guess I should define those properties. Um, I mean, this, so this is the pressure gradient in an elliptical cross-section uh, for fluid flowing with or in, uh, a mass flow rate Q coming in. So uh, flow rate mu is the fluid viscosity. And HF and, and W are defined in the drawing. And I guess I should say that the assumption here is this is a new Newtonian fluid. In an elliptical cross section. <coughs> so that's dealing with the fluid, all right? Now, Snedden and Elliot, Snedden was busy in 1946. This paper is also in 1946. Also, so they published uh, a paper in which they derived from a solid mechanics perspective the width predicted in an elliptical cross section due to some internal pressure with fixed height. And the assumption here is that it's plane strain in the vertical direction along the height. In the direction of HF. So all sort of horizontal sections will remain parallel to one another. So the vertical direction is thick. Okay, so what they did then was now you have two equations. So this one is in terms of width. I can plug that equation into the first one, okay? And then I'm going to assume, I'm going to ignore any leak off. So leak off would be fluid that's injected that's not, you know, that's leaked into the, through the surfaces, which would be reality, right, in any, in any porous media. But so th there, if you ignore leak off, then And another, another assumption here, so we're ignoring leak off, we're, we're also ignoring storage or volume change of the elliptical section due to injection, okay? <clears throat> so if you just simply uh, plug the second equation into the first and then I just want to be clear about what I'm doing. I'm going to plug this equation into that one. Then I'm going to multiply both sides by dx. Right. And so then, then I have, and then, and, take, and, then, and then integrate both sides. So the, the equation I'm going to write down will be that, the, the, inter, the integral equation. And also I'm going to substitute <coughs> 
by QI over 2, right? So basically, this is, the vo this is the volume of fluid injection that's going into one half length of the crack. Okay. So if I, if I inject fluid here, half of it's going to go this way and half of it's going to go that way, right? We're only going to concern ourselves with the going in the positive x direction. So we're going to substitute Q by QI, and then we have an equation. probably should have made this substitution by now to save some ink. But E prime, this expression occur occurs so often in the equations. This is, sometimes we call this the plane strain modulus. So E prime is just this. Okay. So we just save some ink by introducing that new term. And so then if we integrate that equation, we have an expression for P net that's equal to 16 mu QI E prime cubed over pi HF times L. I don't know, did I have the... Yeah, so I, when I integrate, the L comes from the integration here on this side, right? So I integrate this from 0 to L. And that's to the 1 fourth power. And then if we plug that P net back into the equation for the width, we have um, 3 QI L minus X. To the 1 fourth. Right, again, so these are, this is due to Perkins and Kern, 1961. Okay, so this equation for P net incorporates fluid mechanics and solid mechanics, but there's no energetics due to fracturing. Okay, in, in terms of you know how the tip's going to propagate, and so if we go back. Remember I said we had this equation for P net? We're going to hold on to it and come back to it. So we drive this one. So we have two equations for P net, essentially due to this per Perkins and Kern model. The one associated with solid and fluid mechanics, and the one associated with the fracture here, the fracture mechanics here. So which one do we use? Or in a, not necessarily which one do we use, but is the Perkins and Kern model a valid assumption because they ignored the fracture mechanics. This is what the fracture mechanics says the pressure should be for the fracture to propagate. Okay. Well, it turns out that they were able to analyze this and show that even though they ignored the fracture mechanics, the P net here, according to the fluid and the solid mechanics, is always going to be much larger than the other except for very, very low, fro like sort of unrealistically low flow rates, 
or unrealistically low values of uh, fluid viscosity. So, you know, I guess in terms of the fluid viscosity, the values are so low they're just unphysical. So you can sort of ignore that case. And then if you just say, well, we're only going to consider cases where there's a sufficiently high flow rate, this P net is associated with the pressure required to drive the fluid down the fracture that's always going to be greater than the one associated with propagating the fracture. And so we're going to ignore the fracture mechanics. Okay. So it's an assumption in the model. It's not an assumption you'd make in a, you know, in a, in a fully coupled geomechanical computer simulation. You'd, you'd include the fracture mechanics there. But again, we're after a simple analytic model, and so we have to make assumptions and ignore some things. Okay. And so what's ignored here is the fracture mechanics. Okay. And so there, there, there are some, uh, you know, others, other assumptions. So the Perkins and Kern model ignores fracture mechanics. It assumes plane strain in the vertical direction. Leak off is, ne is neglected. And there's a fixed height. Not only is there a fixed height, in that in order to use these equations, you also have to assume a length. Right? There, you have to, there's, no, there's nothing to account for what the length should be. So if you want to do fracture design, it's a little hard because you have to assume the height and the length for these equations to even mean anything. Okay. Or come up with some other way to come up with what the length should be. So let's talk about then the kind of first attempt to come up with a way to determine what the length should be. And also, so th this attempt, also in doing, in doing, in coming up with a way to determine what the link should be, also uh, sort of corrects for the leak off it assumption in the Perkins Kern model. Okay, so. Um, 